Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this episode of the Federal. My name is Naveed Anjum and I am joined today by a very special guest, author, celebrated author, Manreet Sodhi Someshwar, who has just come out with the third book in the Partition Trilogy, that's Kashmir. And of course we'll be talking about Kashmir, but about her other books are also. So welcome to our studio, Manreet. It's so wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you, Naveed. It's a pleasure. So um, at the outset, of course, um, you know, this is, this is a trilogy which has kept you preoccupied for the last uh, two decades. It's a long time. It has, uh, you have invested so much into it, and that shows also in the book. So if we could begin with Kashmir, um, of course, it, this was a very sensitive book to write in the sense that, you know, um, so just a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the series will tell our audience that this, this trilogy, what it does, it does is uh, what it, and, and that's something which struck me the most is that you bring these, uh, you know, historical figures, important historical figures. So you have Jawaharlal Nehru, you have Sadar Patel, then you have Lord Mountbatten. And then on the other hand, you have ordinary people, what you call, uh, you know, Aam Admi and Aam Aurat. And then you put them on the stage, tell their stories from, you know, their perspective. So you have these characters in some way, these characters speaking in some way. You know, you write about them in the third person, but actually, you know, what you do is actually peek inside their minds. Tell us about the genesis of this very, very important, uh, you know, trilogy, which has in introduced us to these untold stories of people immediately in the wake of the, before the partition of course, but, but in, you know, in those years of, you know, when the princely states were sort of uh, acquired by India and it sort of, you know, became part of India. Yeah. Well, thank you, Naveh. That's an excellent question to begin our discussion. So, Kashmir, just holding the book up, uh, yes. book three of the partition trilogy. Uh, as is self-evident, this is a set of three books. Book one is Lahore, book yes. two is Hyderabad, and book three is Kashmir. So just to provide some context yes. for what the books are, uh, Lahore is set in the seven months leading up to the independence and partition of India and yes. a month after. So the narrative arc begins when uh, the last Viceroy of India, Dicky Mountbatten, yes. uh, lands in India mm -hmm. and continues up to September of 1947. Yes. Thereafter, um, there were two princely states, mm -hmm. three princely states in fact, which had not acceded to India at the time of India's independence and partition. Yes. So a lot of people uh, today tend to assume that the map of India that we see today is the map that the British left to us. Yes. But that is uh, very far from the truth because the British controlled two Indias in a sense. One was one they directly governed, mm -hmm. the states, and then there were 565 princely states. Now these states were notionally uh, mm -hmm. governed by the uh, princes and there was a British resident who lived in these states. Yes. Uh, the two largest states were of course Kashmir and Hyderabad. Now at the time of 1947, the, according to partition laws, each of these princely states could accede to India mm -hmm. or Pakistan or choose to remain independent. Yes. So this was a huge effort which was mounted mm -hmm. by the Deputy Prime Minister who was also the Home Minister. Sadar Vallabhai Patel, yes. uh, with the help of his very able uh, Homes Secretary, uh, VP Menon, yes. to get these princely states to accede to India. Because except for two, hmm. all of them were Hindu majority. Yes. So by the laws of partition, they should stay within India. Having said that, on 15th August 1947, there were hmm. three princely states, Junagar, which was a tiny state, mm -hmm. um, Hyderabad and Kashmir, which was still to accede to either of them. Now, Junagadh, the matter gets resolved quickly enough, and I cover that in book two, Hyderabad. Hyderabad yeah. But the story of Hyderabad and Kashmir exists. Now, during my research and talking to people, I figured that the story of Hyderabad has been completely forgotten. Mm -hmm. We have erased it to our memory, whereas the truth is that for a year after independence, mm -hmm. the Nizam of Hyderabad, who was the wealthiest man in the world, was in negotiations with the government of India to see whether he wanted to accede to Pakistan, accede to India, or remain independent. Mm. Uh, in the end, I don't want to give anything away, but readers should read the book to find out. But the That's fact okay. is that uh, on 17th of September 1948, under Operation Polo, mm. India invaded the princely state of Hyderabad and got it to accede to itself. Yeah. What it called so, as a police action. A police action, it, yeah. yeah, which is a very British term which was used for mm. all invasions that were done. So mm. in a sense, 
we acted with our own people like the British, imperial mm. British used to do with us at that time. Right. Uh, and the story of Kashmir, unfortunately, is so convoluted, so tangled up, mm -hmm. that when I talk to people, and my own understanding is that there are a lot of assumptions made about it, but what actually happened in 1947 is something people are not aware of. So my attempt with writing the Partition Trilogy was really to set the narrative straight in the sense of to take the reader and plunge them in that time of 1947, which is a time of immense chaos, uncertainty, uh, both in Delhi, where decisions are being taken, and on the ground, where the armed army and order are having to tussle with the consequences of those decisions. Yeah. So, structurally, therefore, I'm trying to do in this book what, uh, you know, historians say, uh, call, uh, you take the subaltern, which mm -hmm. is yeah. Ahmad Mian Aurat, yes. and the elites, which is the political leaders, but I'm putting them on the same stage. Yes. Because I feel history is nothing if it's not history of the common people, of yes. you and me and us. Yes. Uh, so that is the attempt. So in each of the three books, the narrative is in twin threads, which sort of uh, weave together. In Delhi is Jawaharlal Nehru, Vallabhai Patel, Dikki Mountbatten as my protagonist. And what I mean by that is that they are flesh and blood characters and I sort of, as any writer does with their protagonist, try and speak in their voice. What are their thoughts? What is the uncertainty? What are the doubts that are bedeviling them? To show how complex is the decisions that have to be taken. And then I go to Lahore, to Hyderabad, to Kashmir to show how the ordinary citizens and the residents are dealing with it. And here again I have focus a lot on women because I feel history is really his story yeah. and women's stories tend to get lost. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to rescue them from the interstices of history and make women my central protagonists, put them center and forward so they can take agency, they can tell their stories. Right. So that is the attempt. Right. And uh, since you're talking about that and, uh, you know, uh, 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 women characters, and that is also, uh, you know, one of the very strong, uh, you know, uh, aspect of, of this trilogy in a sense that you know uh, what stays with you I mean of course there are the leaders of uh, th there's the story of these leaders who were actually you know the movers and shakers those who had a say in you know in the in the fortunes and how things would pan out for a lot of people uh, you know in these regions mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know and, and then you had women who had to actually bear the brunt of the violence and large scale heartbreaking kind of stories that you have written about um, if you could tell us uh, a little bit about those characters, I mean, without revealing too many, uh, you know, uh, too much of uh, the novel, uh, give us a sense of uh, the the women characters in the in the trilogy across, you know, from Lahore to Kashmir, and um, and what did it entail for you to sort of, uh, you know, imagine them and bring them to life? Right. So to answer your question, Navid, I'll have to step back mm -hmm. and take the readers, the listeners, to my hometown, right. which is a small town on the border between India and Pakistan. Firozpur. It is called Firozpur. Right. And uh, at the time of India's partition, Firozpur was a Muslim majority town. So by the laws of partition, it should have gone to Pakistan, yes. but it didn't. Mm -hmm. Now there is a lot of speculation about why that happened, and I cover that in, in the narrative of the trilogy. But suffice to say that Firozpur had always been a large cantonment town. Mm -hmm. So. If you look at Radcliffe's line, which is really the boundary or the border between India and Pakistan now, there is a squiggle formed around Firozpur and yeah. then the line continues in northwesterly fashion. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up in that town and I grew up with stories of partition all around me. Every household mm -hmm. had a story or more to tell. Mm -hmm. But I didn't find those stories in my history textbooks. I didn't even find them in a lot of the narrative around. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, the the sparse narrative about partition used to be dates yeah. and what we call the transfer of population which is such an anodyne term mm. because transfer of population literally meant that 12 to 15 million people moved east and west mm. within three months of India's independence and partition so two to five million died so mm. where are those stories for instance yeah. where are the narratives which have not been told and as I said, when I was a child growing up, I was very aware, you know, of these, that there were these stories which are unsaid, 
uh, especially women's stories because you mm -hmm. know when you're a child and let's say there is a something happening in the home mm -hmm. some wedding some other event and people have gathered and you're you know let's say playing with your friends and you're running through rooms and the moment you enter a room which is filled with women women's voices would silent you know mm -hmm. and there's a hush as if they're waiting for you to leave the room and then they can pick up the pace yeah. again and you know when you're a child you don't pay attention to these things mm -hmm. because just they're just part of the background also, my um, adolescence coincided with what is known as the period of Sikh militancy. Mm -hmm. And I remember at that time, people in Firozpur would say, and I'll say it in Punjabi and then translate in English, yes. that Santali wapis aagaya. It's 47 all over again. Mm -hmm. And suffice to say, I was, I was just so keen to leave my messy town behind. I did engineering, went to IIM Calcutta had a corporate career in Bombay mm. and then I moved out of India after at a point in time and I went to Singapore yes. and I was taking a break from work uh, for six months sabbatical and Singapore is such a contrast to India mm. you know to India is, it is orderly compared to India's chaos mm -hmm. and I just felt these memories bubbling up because mm. I think after a long period of time I had time mm. my mind was free and it was almost as if the mustard fields of Firozpur were colliding with mm -hmm. Singapore's orderly mm -hmm. lanes. And I could not understand why. And I thought, okay, I'm an engineer, I'm an MBA, I know how to deal with these things, I'll write a short story and get it done with. Yeah. But the short story became a long story and I realized that I do not even know why things happened the way they happened. Why mm -hmm. did the militancy happen? So as I started questioning that, everything kept taking me back to the pivotal point of 1947. Mm -hmm. So I remember when I went back home for the first time, I started to question my parents, mm -hmm. question the extended family, and people were very reluctant to talk about 47 mm -hmm. because it is a period of intense trauma. Absolutely. People have buried it, they have sealed their lips, they just want to move forward. Mm -hmm. But I realized that there was something there and I had to go after it. So. I spent a lot of time collecting oral archives because mm -hmm. I also figured that a lot of people were elderly, they were frail, they were of a generation where time was scarce for me as a researcher to hear their stories and that's what I ended up doing. So to now go back to your question, I the, f the f women characters that I create in Lahore, in Hyderabad, in Kashmir are really composite characters derived from a lot of the oral stories that I have heard because I feel that uh, it is the best way for me to bring those women's stories alive by embodying them in certain female characters. So for instance in Lahore I have Tara and Pammi as two lead female yes. characters mm -hmm. and so these are stories of trauma but they are also told through relationships, yes. through friendships, through stories of love, mm -hmm. through stories of love between obviously a man and a woman, love between two brothers, love within the community, mm -hmm. between yeah. communities yeah. because I do feel that even in the toughest of times when things are going terribly wrong like a cataclysm like partition, what really was at stake was love and humanity and friendships and I want to bring that forth mm -hmm. and I feel that women are always uh, pivotal in relationships, right? Women, the story of every woman is a story of her relationships her relationship with the parents, with her spouse, with the spouse's family, with the neighbors, with the children. And therefore I'm, I'm bringing those stories alive. Mm -hmm. In Hyderabad I did the same with, I have really strong female characters, there is Uzma, there is Jabili, yes. and there is Princess Nilofar herself, herself yeah. who was the wife of the Nizam's younger son, who is a fascinating character. Very interesting character. And I wanted mm -hmm. to bring her alive. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, and the good wor work that she did, the charities that she uh, uh, organized in Hyderabad, uh, a women's hospital which exists to this day mm -hmm. and provides uh, neonatal care and pediatric care and gynecological care to women in Hyderabad. And then coming to Kashmir, yeah. Uh, where, Zuni. yeah, yes. Kashmir is one place where people have no idea of the extent to which the women in the state of Jammu and Kashmir yeah. rallied and offer their own resistance yes. and I feel women's stories are no less brave or courageous or adventurous than the stories of men doing battles and, and fighting 
and in Kashmir I have four female characters. There is Zuni, her sister Kashmira, uh, Durga and uh, Margot yeah. who is a um, American journalist who yeah. is in Srinagar at the time of the Kabaili's arrival. Mm -hmm. And through each of them I'm trying to showcase how women are facing very tough situations mm -hmm. and the extraordinary lengths to which they go to keep themselves, their families, their children safe. Because we have seen over and over again that when men go to battle, it's women's bodies that become the battlefield. True. So the, the immense price that women pay, I want to showcase it again. And in Kashmir, I have a character who's based on a real life character called Zoon Gujri or Zuni Gujar. Yeah. She's called by these two names. And she was a sniper. She was a real fighter in the in the self-defense army in the valley wow. and so mm -hmm. I try to bring her alive as a flesh and blood character to show what Kashmiri women did mm -hmm. uh, to keep themselves and their homeland safe. Right. You have written that there's very little information about actually her. That, that, did that entail that you know you had to sort of invent some part of or reinvent some parts of her? Yeah absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I, I you know uh, uh, writing historical fiction the way mm -hmm. I do mm -hmm. It's a very rigorous process because I use something, there's a term called critical fabulation, which yes. is a term coined by Celia Hartman, yeah. who is an American uh, professor. Uh, and I was very fortunate, she was teaching at the college where I was doing my MFA, and now she's moved on to Columbia University. Right. But critical scaffolding literally means that you do rigorous amount of research, and then that forms a skeleton upon which you add uh, the padding of flesh through yeah. imagination. So, for instance, in the game, case of Zuni, um, there is very scarce information available, but we do have pamphlets printed mm -hmm. at time featuring Zuni okay. as a character, and they show Zuni. She's 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 a sniper. She's got this yeah. rifle. Yeah. Uh, she's wearing these you know very circular hooped earrings that Kashmiri women wear, and that was one of the pamphlets created to motivate women mm -hmm. to step out of their homes and take up arms to whatever extent, so right. they could defend themselves. Uh, against the violence that was expected because the Kabailis had just l done indiscriminate amount of violence mm -hmm. against everybody, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, wherever they encountered them till they came to the outskirts of the valley. And so there is, there is some information available about Zuni but obviously not enough. Mm -hmm. I don't know who her family was. Mm -hmm. So I take the liberty or I would say I use a creative imagination right. to situate Zuni and give her a family, Kashmira is a sister, who is right. very different from her. And mm -hmm. I try to bring her alive, as I said, through the composite stories that I've heard, and which is what I use Zuni to embody those, those right. stories. And also her relationship with others, others like yes. you know, the families. And yes. all. Okay, um, at the very outset, I think you mentioned that, you know, when it comes to Kashmir and um, in India, I think to talk about Kashmir is, a, of course, a very, uh, you know, kind of treacherous <laughs> zone <laughs> to go into. But um, I, I would just focus on the book and, uh, and what it talks about and, uh, you know, when it comes to Kashmir. And, of course, it's a, it goes back in time. It talk, it's talks about a specific point in history. And uh, you, you begin with two fallacies that, you know, that people do while talking about Kashmir, uh, make uh, while uh, talking about Kashmir, and th that is to assume that that you know Kashmir is just the valley and they forget a large part of it right mm. so to just think that Srinagar is just Kashmir and yes. you know what happens to Jammu or what happens to Ladakh for instance which is like you know a Buddhist dominated as we all know um, area and the other thing is that you know the trouble uh, when when we sort of trace the genesis of that trouble and we we most of us I think tend to think that you know it was actually uh, you know uh, you know the the invasion from Pakistan that uh, you know this Kabyle is coming to you know uh, Poonch when when it all began but right. that again you're saying that you know that is really not the true story because right. you know it was it had to do with and uh, and that brings me to the you know the two male protagonists of the story that Sheikh Abdullah and major figure in the story in fact in in, in this uh, you know uh, part of the trilogy that Sheikh Abdullah and Maharaja Hari Singh and how central were they and if you could talk about you know both these two things that you wanted to make very clear in the beginning mm -hmm. and then coming uh, to the uh, you know these two protagonists of yeah, uh, right. uh, and their minds and as, as you have written um, you know in the preceding uh, you know the two uh, parts of the trilogy we have seen that you know how you sort of uh, as I mentioned in the beginning that you delve into their mind the interiority of these characters right, if you could talk right. about that. Sure. Yeah. 
Sure. Yeah, so as you said, you know, um, uh, a common assumption people make about mm -hmm. Kashmir is that, oh, the Kabailis invaded and India had to send army and that's how sort of the, the war yeah. begins. Yeah. Now, the thing is that the first Indo-Pak war, yes, it does begin barely two months after India's independence and partition, mm. but we need to go back in time yeah. because Maharaja Hari Singh was the ruler of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, which mm. was geographically, by region, the largest state. Yeah. Uh, by population, by numbers, Hyderabad was the largest state. And I also want our listeners to remember that both Hyderabad and Kashmir, the action is happening at the same time, yeah. which means that the leaders in Delhi are having to deal with these two very complex problems yeah. at the same time. The only reason that these two are not in one book is because it's too much for us as readers to handle. Yeah. They're very complex stories and that's why I break them up into two narratives. Mm -hmm. So getting back to Kashmir, mm -hmm. Maharaja Hari Singh rules it like a like, like an autocrat, like a king. Mm -hmm. And I would again remind listeners that we should not use the morals and principles of today to judge historical characters. Yes. What I mean by that is that Hari Singh is a typical despot. He rules with authority, he's an authoritarian ruler, and he, the brunt of his uh, policies falls right. very, so harshly, yeah. very harshly, very mm -hmm. harshly on the poor, the peasantry, mm -hmm who were taxed very heavily because that's how the Maharaja's coffers got filled, as it did in mo wherever mm. kings ruled, wherever yeah. they were monarchs. Mm. Mm. And Sheikh Abdullah had risen, in fact, in revolt against the Maharaja's excessively brutal policies yeah. because Abdullah came from the people. He mm. came from a family of shawl weavers. Yeah. So he understood it very well, you know, what were the problems that they were facing. Mm. And uh, so there are these two characters, Maharaja Hari Singh, the ruler, and Sheikh Abdullah, who is the revolutionary, the rebel, but is also the leader of the masses. And Sheikh Abdullah is so popular that Hari Singh jails him as frequently as he can to keep him out of the public view. And now his wife, Begum Jahan Akbar, mm -hmm. was the one who actually then took his message outside and campaigned on his behalf, something which is either not known or we don't talk about often enough. Mm -hmm. And I try and show her contribution, how she was both an ally and a partner with her husband in his struggle. So that is uh, one thing. Mm -hmm. The other is that a lot of us uh, Indians uh, assume that the state of Jammu and Kashmir is mm -hmm. the valley, Srinagar. Yeah. <laughs> now the valley is probably the most beautiful part of the state, yeah. but it is a part of the state. As you said, there is uh, Jammu, yeah. there is Ladakh, there is Gilgit, Pakistan. Yeah. And this was also a, while it was a Muslim majority state, even the compositions were very different. Mm -hmm. uh, Ladakh was Buddhist majority. Jammu had a slight Hindu majority. Mm -hmm. Gilgit Baltistan was Muslim, but they were Shia Muslims. Uh, so they followed a very different form of, of Islam and its practice. And there was very tribal uh, uh, relig religiosity was, you know, yeah. sort of conflated with that. So we're talking about a very complex state, which in fact, Hari Singh is aware of. What Hari Singh really wants is for status quo. He wants, okay, India ban jayega, Pakistan will get mm -hmm. formed, but can we, and he continue to reign as a monarch of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Mm -hmm. So he's aiming for a Switzerland kind of neutrality between the newly independent India and Pakistan. That is his mm -hmm. wish. Mm -hmm. But Sheikh Abdullah and the people that he's representing don't want Hari Singh, mm. because a continuation of Hari Singh means a continuation of tyranny. Yeah. And people want democracy. They want their voice to be heard. They want those rights. And so we are, have these two people in sort of opposition to each other. And the other very important thing is that in uh, Kashmir, for instance, I start the mm. narrative arc in May of 1947. Yeah. And that is because uh, the Maharaja's excessive taxation policy is falling so harshly on people that in the region of uh, Poonch, yeah. a lot of the people have risen in rebellion. Yeah. And I would like to remind our listeners that uh, the Poonchis were considered very martial. Mm. So the British had this tradition of classifying certain people as martial race, like the Punjabi, the Sikhs, yeah. and the Punjabi Muslims were considered martial people. So were the Poonchis. Mm -hmm. Now, why is it important to our narrativist that a lot of these Poonchis had fought in World War II mm. and even in World War I? 
So there were what are called disbanded soldiers, which means they still had their weapons on them. Mm. Now this is a very intensely agitated situation. We have these soldiers who do not want to face you know, the tyranny of the Maharaja, who still have their arms with them and who are rebelling, yeah. who are saying we will not accept this taxation. So there is a, a faction of these under uh, a, lead, a leader called Sardar Ibrahim and they are sending messages to Jinnah saying, look, you have to help us because you have to help us fight um, the Maharaja's tyranny. So this is where I start the narrative by yeah, saying, yeah. look, let's, the Kabailis will come, but, but mm. they will come later. Mm. These are the issues the state is facing. This is how Hari Singh and Sheikh Abdullah are facing off each other. Yeah. And this is what is happening in what we now call the region of Pakistan-occupied Kashmir or yeah. Azad Kashmir as it is known on the other side. Mm. Those people were already in rebellion against Maharaja Hari Singh in May of 1947, well before India has got independence and right. the two countries have come to yeah. be formed. Yeah. Okay, um, you know, uh, a trilogy like this, uh, Monday, uh, of course, entails you talking about how extensive research that it, uh, you know, entailed and you had to uh, do. Um, a little bit about, uh, you know, sifting through this extensive material and, and arriving at these, uh, how you have written this uh, entire trilogy in, in short chapters, which are based in a year and the place they are in. So it's a, it, 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 it's also, uh, you know, because it's considering you are capturing the frenzy of the time, that pacing is, is, and it keeps you hooked. The moment you start reading all three, in fact, you are, you know, it sort of draws you in the narrative. Uh, there's violence, there's a lot of things that you get to discover and imagine how would it have been. So if you could talk about the structure and the pacing a bit across this trilogy. Right. Yeah, that was something which I struggled with for a while mm -hmm. uh, because as I, as I said it's kind of based on two decades of research right. and what that means is that I have a lot of information but uh, uh, finally this is a historical novel I want people to read it yeah. I don't want them to put it on a shelf and say it's history and history is boring I also want to capture the frenzy of the time because time itself is a thriller in 1947 and so I have these very conflicting, I want to show the depth of and the rigor of what really happened, but I also want to make it readable. And I was struggling with how to do it when I both came in contact with Sadia Hartman's philosophy and I also reached that by my own research saying, look, the Delhi thread is largely like narrative non-fiction, but obviously um, if I want Jawaharlal Nehru to be my character, and I call him Jawahar, and Sardar Vallabhai Patel, who's this very hallowed figure, and mm -hmm. rightly so, but for me he is Vallabh. Mm -hmm. And then there is Dicky, who yeah. is Dicky Mountbatten. Mount Mount so if yeah. I have to write about them in their voice, I need to know who this person is and share it with my reader. Mm -hmm. So for instance, when Jawahar gets up first thing in the morning, what does he do? He does a headstand. Yeah. That was what he used to do. Uh, what is uh, Vallabhai Patel particularly fond of? What does he like to do? He was very fond of tea. Mm -hmm. And his uh, daughter, Mani Ben, who was both his assistant, his record keeper, his timekeeper, his homemaker. So she would monitor, in fact, ration the amount of tea he could have because mm -hmm. the time spent incarcerated in the jails of the British mm -hmm. had left him with a liver which was damaged. And therefore, so I have a scene where uh, Jawaharlal Nehru visits Vallabhai Patel and they used to stay very close to each other mm -hmm. and Jawaharlal Nehru was younger mm -hmm. and he would always walk over to discuss if he had an issue instead of you know picking up the phone and uh, so he comes and he says yes he will have tea and Vallabhai Patel is looking at money saying can I have and she says no no you aren't having tea mm -hmm. so I wanted to show how they're real people you mm -hmm. know they are obviously uh, the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister but, but they're also fathers they're also uh, people who have are friends yeah. Uh, you know, their community leaders. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to show them uh, in, in the real form. And that's why I decided that first and foremost, I'm going to lead with characters. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let them speak as people and show their turmoil, the inner turmoil, how they're dealing with it, how they're coming to these decisions in Delhi, and then how those decisions are affecting the people in Lahore, Hyderabad, and Kashmir, how their turmoil gets exaggerated, e exemplified, what's happening on the ground. 
so it, it was a tough call but i think mm -hmm. you know um um gulzar saab who i met early on in my career who was very kind to blurb from one of my first books he had told me one thing he said ki just because you've written one book mm -hmm. you know you should not think your journey has ended right. you have to write daily because writing he said is tapasya hai ye karne se aata hai yeah. this is yeah. like a penance you yeah. have to do it daily you have to stay with it and i always advise uh, aspiring writers that there is no magic to writing you yeah. just have to do it daily and then i think through that forest a path seems to emerge yeah. and then you start walking the path and you know daily you bring your tools you mm -hmm. <laughs> cut back a little more of the grass form more of the path and mm -hmm. eventually you do find a way for yourself mm -hmm. so i i'm glad you're saying that because mm -hmm. when i discussed very early on with my mm -hmm. nephew that i this is my plan i want to write books yeah. like this he was like masi who's going to read that it's going to be going to so boring mm -hmm. but i want to show that history is not boring mm -hmm. because it is our stories mm -hmm. and they are full of drama and energy and excitement and loss and love and, and i want to bring it to the page right so um, apart from the fact that you know you bring common narratives and 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 uh, with with the narratives of uh, you know the you know the people who mattered uh, you know at that point of time um, you also what you do is basically uh, as you were saying that and we're talking about interiority and uh, you know the the personal and the political and uh, in this book uh, you do that with the family of uh, maharaja hari singh and his son and you know his wife of course you uh, and there's very intimate details you know so yeah. that also would have involved uh, you know researching you know in those zones when yes. you were working on th that one yes. yeah so in both in hyderabad for instance i do the same thing with the nizam of hyderabad right, and here right, with right. Uh, maharaja hari singh another interesting character yeah. you know because yeah. i feel we don't know anything mm. they are mm. just people we have read as names in history yeah. books yeah. maharaja hari singh of jammu and kashmir nizam mm. of hyderabad but who are they right. what do they do what is important to them what are their motivations what is their family yeah. and for instance in uh, uh, while researching for kashmir i came across this excellent memoir mm -hmm. which is written by hari singh's son uh, oh. karan singh okay. who was yeah. who was called tiger he was nicknamed tiger, yeah, nicknamed tiger so right. uh, in, in the narrative uh, tiger is 13 14 years old when yeah. when kashmir is uh, is happening the narrative is unfolding and i i again use go inside a tiger and and try and show how things are happening yeah. i mean says what is happening to his father mm. how his mother reacting to it and and you know the terror that one senses all around them yeah. and i think uh, you know uh, one uh, of the ways when you have a story which is as complex mm. as layered as rich and still as fragmented as kashmir and as i think even with hyderabad and lahore i think fiction and storytelling is a good way to get into that mm -hmm. because stories are one of our most primitive forms of communication you know right. well, i mean history tells us scientists tell us anthropologists tell us that millennia back you know we, we when we started we would sit around a fire mm -hmm. and, and tell stories yeah and the storyteller if his story was not good enough then he would get he or she would get it walloped in the head mm. now we get trolled mm. <laughs> so but i think stories are what 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 help us understand yeah. uh, each other mm. it, it's it's our essential need to be heard to be told stories and i think once we tell stories we the distance closes between mm. you and me True. us and them we we are on the same page mm. so that has always been my attempt to make hari singh alive to make uh, you know tiger alive to make sheikh abdullah alive and not right. these hallowed figures yeah. uh, you know in framed posters of the wall or sitting in sculptures but real life and blood people and they what they feel what they want to say how do they view things true and give us an appreciation you know for how difficult a struggle it was mm -hmm. um, you know for our um, uh, ancestors our forefathers and mothers to bring us uh, mm -hmm. what we what we take for granted nowadays absolutely no in fact you're right and uh, there's so many details about current thing for instance that you didn't know as a person yeah. and or or as a child you know is right. going up years and all that that you know unless you are specifically looking for those books you don't get to know because right. current thing in the popular this thing uh, imagination would be what we have 
by and large read uh, you know uh, yeah. and his maharaja karan and his maharaja karan singh always yeah. is the hallowed uh, this thing yes. so so uh, another question uh, manreet about uh, considering it has been a very ambitious kind of trilogy for you ambitious mm -hmm. project for you a passion yeah. project so to speak um if you could give us a sense of what's next i mean of course you know <laughs> you are relieved now it's <laughs> over and you have you want to go to another zone maybe another uh, you know subject but uh, have you thought about it uh, at this <laughs> stage or how does it, uh, you know how 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 does that uh, is that going to work for you now right well if that's a question my publisher has already asked him <laughs> and okay. i said no 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 i ain't answering that yeah. you're right that the yeah. the trilogy has been a very mm -hmm. ambitious goal i set for myself it's a mammoth mm -hmm. project and i'm just relieved mm -hmm. that i have managed to accomplish it and now i have offered it to the readers uh, inshallah you know they will they will connect with the stories they will share the stories and hopefully arrive at a greater understanding of what is our common history you know of all of us uh, as for going forward you know i am one of those writers who always have these ideas in my head um, uh, and I, i will just say that i have a few ideas i don't know which one i'm going to put, pick up uh but i'm really hoping to do something radically different because i feel that um, you know uh when i when i go to a narrative with a lot of joy and not knowingness mm -hmm. i don't know how it's going to turn out there is a sense of sense of adventure and spirit So inshallah we'll see how that unfolds and uh, we can have a conversation again when that Absolutely. book comes out. I'll look forward to that. On that note uh, Manreet thank you so much. It was lovely uh, to have had this conversation around the trilogy. Hopefully when your book next book comes out we'll have another conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> It's all my pleasure. Thank you. Subscribe to the Federal's YouTube page for more news and updates.